the Scaling Japan podcast. A podcast about how to grow your business from $100,000 and beyond. And beyond. In the land of the rising sun. Welcome to the Scaling Japan podcast. I am your host, Tyson Batino, and we have a very awesome episode as always. Today's guest is Pascal. Jerberu Gairaru, and he is the Japan Managing Director for Unibiz, and also the Strategic Advisor for SCS Imagitech. What you'll learn in this episode is how to use shareholders to scale your company, but also how to interact with big Japanese corporations. I first heard about Pascal through his role as Managing Director of BioSibon, which is the French chain of grocery stores in Japan. And I actually used to frequent the location in Yokohama quite a bit. And、uh, I discovered Pascal in my search for other foreigners who have scaled a physical location business to more than 10 locations. And he was the first person I found. And actually, today's our first time to meet. So, Pascal, can you please give a self introduction? Thanks, Tyson. And、uh, thanks very much for getting my name right. In the Japanese fashion.、Uh, that's、uh, so very rare these days, so much appreciated. So, hello everyone. I'm Pascal Jabagayar, French citizen, 40 year old. I've been in Japan overall、uh, for roughly nine years now in two different、uh, sessions and in China in between. So, currently I'm heading Unabiz Japan entity. So, Unabiz is an IoT company,、uh, especially we are focusing on developing devices,、uh, both hardware and software. For the Internet of Things, namely in a few different industries,、um, the smart metering business. So, we actually、uh, delivered within three years more than 1.2 million devices to Nippon Gas, the largest gas operator in Japan. And we do a lot of other solutions to track assets, to do facility management. So, brand new IT world, changing quite a lot for me from my background in、uh, retail.、Uh, and as you said before this position, I've been working for five years. Uh, starting Biosebo in Japan、uh, in partnership with Eon from scratch. And we ramp up from zero stores to 27、uh, within、uh, roughly four years and a half. So, very, very happy to be with you and、uh, discuss, discuss about、uh, how to scale businesses in Japan. So, you are one of the masters of scaling. And I think now this is your second challenge. But、uh, yes, I'm actually curious like,、uh, what are some of the unique scaling challenges、uh, you're facing with Unibiz now? So, Unabiz is a rather young company because the company was founded in Singapore、uh, five years ago. And actually,、uh, as pretty many startups do, we have pivoted from quite a lot of angles、uh, quite a lot of times.、Uh, we started as an operator in Singapore and then in Taiwan for telecommunication、uh, using a very specific network called Sigfox, which is a French based technology. And we developed the network in Singapore, we developed it in,、uh, in Taiwan. and We realized quickly that、uh, it's just like building highways. It's great to build highways. You have fares, you're expecting fares from、uh, the incoming traffic. But if you don't have traffic, then you get no fees. So from there, we really pivoted to produce more devices. And then we started selling those devices, designed those devices, mass produced them, sell it,、uh, not custom, just like off the shelves from Taiwan, where our design、uh, home is. And we just realized that it was impossible to reach a required cost, a required volume to be massively successful. And then we pivoted once again to do custom based、uh, bespoke solutions for big B2B clients. And so happened that the, the first really one to bite on this with a th- stroke of luck was Nichigas. Nichigas was、wow. uh, having that. Yes. So from the get go, Um, they were actually working with the Japanese suppliers to do their smart wireless gas meters. And they had problems of scaling with the solutions that the Japanese company was offering. It would have taken them more than five years to deploy the solutions. And the solution was extremely expensive.、Uh, we were talking about roughly $100 per device. So that threw the whole economics、uh, completely out of the window. And the timing as well, because you didn't have, you had to manage. Fleet of people going to the counters at the same time as you were doing the ramp up. And in five year time, you would have to change、um, the meters all over again. So, basically, never ending story. So, understanding that issue, what we did is we redesigned completely、uh, the hardware, really from scratch, to reach very, very 
um, better cost target. Uh, roughly speaking, we divide it by uh, a factor of four. And at the same time, we totally changed the shape so that installation could be done in less than 20% of the time being used. So that means uh, we install a little bit more from start to beginning, I mean, beginning to the end. In less than two years, we got 850,000 devices designed, produced, shipped to Japan, installed in Japan, and on the grid. That's the biggest deployment, fastest deployment ever in the world. And we did this with, without even having people on the ground from the entity. No entity here, no people. And I just joined when we were around uh, 500,000 devices deployed. So oh, everything wow. remotely. Which is incredible, uh, frankly speaking. So, which proves also, you know, as a as a scale up, as a startup, you can still do a lot of things. Uh, we're only seventy people now in the company. Uh, here in Japan, we are getting close to being three. And using this as a base, now we have a very good, uh, let's say, visibility, obviously, on the Japanese market, which is helping our second stage of development. Yeah, you finally got the Jiseki, or I guess so. Uh, you got yes. that one big client. We have a big client, we have the, the recognition, but still, as you know, it's still not enough because now we have uh, the Japanese entity. And so the, all the clients are looking at the Japanese entity and say, oh, wow, the company was just founded last year, actually. Well, <laughs> we've been around for a little bit more. Uh, we have yeah. quite a big, you know, big number of references. Actually, we're one of the largest players in the world. Yeah. So once again, uh, this is Japan. You have to fill and you have to tick all the right boxes. So some of those clearly were not there yet because, well, as I said, the company was just incorporated in Japan last year, but we can play on, on, on our other successes to push the business forward. And actually right now it's going, it's going very well. Yeah, definitely. Or I mean, to get that really huge contract in such short time, that's an awesome way to start. Or at least you don't have to wait like two, three years to get that big contract and go the, I think the, the typical route is getting the smaller vendors or like we'll say smaller partnerships, smaller vendors, then going upstream. But I guess you pretty much got the big fish from the beginning. Yes. And actually there was a way to do it. The, the reason we got the big fish is that because what we offered the big fish in terms of mindset development and possibility for success wasn't existing in Japan, actually. They couldn't get what they wanted in Japan. And they instantly understood uh, that if they didn't, I mean, we pushed them really, really hard like really hard. Uh, usually, you know, to grow a business in Japan, you would go slowly, like clockwork. You start small project, then you get a little bit bigger, and then a little bit bigger, et cetera, et cetera, until you reach massive scale. In IoT, you can't do that because you can't produce uh, big volume. economics, gotcha. Yes, you need to have scale from the get-go. So the only way to go massive, the only way to get all the benefits on the cost of the device, on the volume of data, is to go basically from zero to one. It's a very binary process. And it's very hard for Japanese to understand that because for them, it's a very risky proposal. They see it as a, as a risk. They can't scale it slowly, gradually. Because I'm pretty sure they, they wanted to just say, like, we want to test it in one location. Exactly. Uh, we want to do first uh, proof of concept, then a second one, then let's start with 10 devices, then we do 100, then we do a thousand, then we do 10,000. It's like, okay, it's going to take forever. <laughs> <You're never> gonna, <laughs> you will never succeed if you do that. So as a matter of fact, we started with one POC only, very limited numbers. I think we only got 50 devices on the field, and then we got the contract for one more than 1 million devices. And that's yeah. because we uh, pushed them, it's because we went directly to the CEO, we explain that, well, basically we, we give him a silver lining on the horizon. I think that's one of the perks of being a foreigner in Japan. You're, you can do that. That's one of the things you can do. You can go in, you can explain something which is totally crazy. And if it were coming you know, from a, a Japanese person, uh, they would think, well, this person is crazy. Uh, we can't do business with them. But because you're a foreigner, I you're gotcha. not allowed to do that. It's part so of the guiding part. So if a Japanese person were to do that, would that be considered as, uh, let's say, that person has a lack of common sense, therefore they're crazy, therefore we may not want to partner with this person? I think so. Frankly speaking, I think so. Because you would be so remote, I mean, so far away from the, the usual accepted behavior that I won't say it's impossible, but it would look far much more difficult to sell in a way, whereby, you know, we're foreigners, we're used to that, it's usual, we can do this. And if you do that, oh, 
we're going to succeed. So obviously, it takes a special type of partner to agree <laughs> with that kind of approach <laughs> on the Japanese side, that's for sure. But at least using this, we were able to scale to provide a solution uh, very quickly. If we had been following the traditional sales process, it would never have happened. So you have to you have to know what are your cards, what you can play, and this is one one way to play it. Awesome. So I guess I guess one way of scaling is actually turning a six step selling process. Let's say you go yes. ten, maybe fifty, hundred, thousand, ten thousand, one million. You turned it into a two step process essentially. Exactly. Awesome. Exactly. Uh, you mentioned like using shareholders as an outsourced sales force. I definitely think this is something that uh, many people aren't utilizing, but could you explain more? Sure. So see, the interesting point about uh, Unabiz as a company is that right now, so as I said, the head uh, office or HQ is in Singapore and the Japanese business has only started really like two years ago, but Japan is our biggest market. And our biggest shareholders right now are Japanese. So, and we are right now raising our Series C, but the lead investors for Series B, Series A, and uh, and even post seed were all Japanese companies. So at three uh, raising love, I mean times, we all had seed investors. I mean, all had investors. The lead investors were Japanese companies. Uh, the first one was KDDI through uh, Suracom, so uh, really communications company. Uh, for the lead A series investor was Global Brain, uh, which is a, a venture fund uh, in Japan, quite well known in the, in the tech business. And the last one uh, for series B uh, was actually Sparks, a Sparks fund, which LP are SMBC and Toyota. So we're very Japanese in both our shielding and both our core market, even though, as I said, we only recently established the base here. And having in the shareholding, so companies like KDDI, uh, like Soracom, like the bank, SMBC, is actually opening up a lot of doors, and especially the banks. What's interesting about SMBC is, as a, one of the three mega banks, and it's the same also for the two mega banks, apart from their usual financing activity, they have a leasing activity. And the leasing activity means they have ties to all the big industrial groups in Japan. And one of our key issues in supplying IoT is always the cost of the hardware. The cost of the hardware is maybe 90% of the total cost of a solution. The connectivity, especially using uh, Sigfox, is really low. You're talking roughly, let's say, $1 per year in terms of connectivity. The software base would be a couple dollars, a couple three dollars, but the hardware can go from $20 to maybe $50. So if you want to go massive, as I said, which is really the goal, if you want to be successful, that means you have a cash out for the client, which is quite huge at the very beginning of a deal. So now if you transform that approach into a leasing model, a subscription model, just like for your, your telephone and telephone fee, you're not buying the hardware. Uh, the cost of the hardware is split among the length of your contract. So it could be three years. So you're transforming a big issue into IoT as a service. And that is a business model which is very, very attractive to the banks and especially to the leasing arms of the banks because now they have a solution which is innovative, which can bring additional value whereby up until now they were only competing who's got the best interest rate basically for the leasing of uh, industrial machinery. And now you have so IoT solutions which are bringing value. You can track where the assets are. As of now, believe it or not, the leasing companies have no clue where the assets they're financing are located in Japan. And you can have assets worth millions of dollars. They don't know where they are. So <laughs> in case they lose it, huh, what do you do? So we're providing a lot of added value for them. And on top of it, it's also fitting very well into their business model because they can invoice it on a monthly basis. So it's additional value from a technological perspective. It's changing the business model of the clients. So the clients are benefiting in a lot of ways. It's additional insurance for the leasing company because they know where the assets are located. It's a whole game changer, basically, for the industry. So the good thing for us is that the bank has very well understood that. And so now they have, you know, the bank's teams of hundreds of salespeople all over Japan in connection of all with all these big corporates. So what I'm doing right now is I'm pitching, I'm educating all the sales force 
uh, of the banks and basically they're doing the sales job for me. Excellent. Now that <laughs> I'll say that's masterclass in scaling your company when you don't have all the money in the world or you don't have some billionaire backing exactly. your grandfather backing you up. So what we do right now is we're hacking the Japanese system, basically, <laughs> <laughs> to leverage it to sell our solutions with a massive reference, which is Nitigas. And uh, it's been proving quite successful. The only downside to it, compared to the approach we had with Nitigas, is that you are getting a little bit more back into a, a Japanese kind of sales process. So it's taking more time. It's taking more time because you're into more, let's say, traditional sales processes. So it takes a bit more time. But at the same time, we totally multiply by 100 uh, the, the, the contacts we had with all the relevant teams. Uh, we have more than 20 people uh, working almost full time for us uh, on those solutions. So I can't complain, <laughs> frankly speaking. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, but I mean, the genius move is that you're able to create alignment between yourself where you have the product or service that is revolutionary or can, let's say, can make a big change. And, but also on the other end of the partner, they have the network, they have the capital, but they don't have the ideas. Exactly. exactly. So that seems like a perfect marriage. And they also have, let's say the, the corporate credibility and ties, which is also important. Because as I said, even though we have uh, a very big reference in Japan, even though we're quite successful, even though we have big shareholders, et cetera, at the same time, if I were to approach all those big corporates by myself, the sales process would be far much longer, far much longer. You need to have uh, basically, uh, let's say having a big brother helping us out is definitely helpful. Definitely helpful. Uh, gotcha. the credibility. So rather than like sourcing the lead, cold calling, or trying to get in, you're pretty much, you can just skip to the meeting, right? Exactly. And we can have access to the top decision makers also in the company. And you know, so the solutions we pro we actually provide are part of um, what we call DX, industry, I mean, really digitalization of the companies. And for the listeners to the podcast, as um, let's say, surprising as it may be, and Japan is quite lacking in that sense. People would tend to see Japan as a, a very technologically advanced nation, which is true by some aspects, but they're totally lagging in some areas. Uh, the smart metering uh, I was mentioning, my God, very, very, very far away versus the, what's happening uh, in Europe, in the US, etc. Retail, uh, where I was involved, compared to, to what I was doing in France, for example, oh my God, we're still having paper price tags. In Europe, uh, or elsewhere in the world, we've been using electronic shelf labels for more than 30 years. And there are all these good reasons you know, this is Japan, you know, this is different, you know, we can't do this. Yes, sure. But the, the good thing is with COVID, as a matter of fact, people not going that easily to the workplace, you see that there is a need for change and population decreasing as well, cost increasing, you have to do something. So the situation is that now a lot of the boards are understanding that they need to do something, but they can't find really good solutions. They can't always find really good solutions. So there is a huge amount of opportunities available right now for, let's say, technological companies, tech-savvy companies, which can understand the overall Japanese ecosystem, which would know how to get into this uh, to propose uh, their solution. You need to localize a little bit, obviously. Uh, it needs to be in Japanese. You need to fit the sales process, as I said, somehow. But it's opportunity for everybody to take right now. It's crazy. Yeah, and the listeners, they call it DX, but digital transformation. And this episode is recorded on February 16th, 2022. And this is one of the big buzzwords in Japan now. And the government, I know they're putting money into it as well. Clearly. Just also what I can say is um, we've been supported by the, the Tokyo government. And JTRO has been backing us up also quite uh, quite well. So the Japanese government recognizes that they need to do they need to do something. They need to increase the speed uh, of digitalization in Japan. So once again, uh, don't be afraid. To come over. <laughs> Things to do, but be <laughs> warned that uh, you need to know where you're stepping. <laughs> <laughs> 
Like what you're listening to and ready to scale your company? Let Tyson coach you and your team to make the jump. You can find more information about our coaching and advisory services at www.scalingyourcompany.com. Now, back to our podcast. Yeah, you've covered a lot on dealing with corporates, but do you have any other advice on how to be taken seriously by big corporates in Japan? Consistence, credibility, consistency. You have to understand the culture somehow. So you, even if you don't speak the language, uh, you need to understand what makes you trustworthy. So having the backers, as I said, but also you yourself and the company itself, if you commit on something, you need to deliver and you need to deliver within a time frame. Uh, and if something happens, you need to stand behind your product. You need to be there even when the going gets tough and it will at some point of time. So that's, you really need to understand that you're in for the long run, um, that it will take time in any case, uh, that you need to be a hundred percent behind your product, that quality is non-negotiable and all of this, you better factor in before you come in. Otherwise you are going to be in a lot of trouble. And actually I have one question. So my experience is mainly with B2C and scaling, but so my definition of consistency might be different than what's a B2B corporate approach of consistency. Could you elaborate on your use of the term consistency? Sure. I've done B2C, I've done B2B, B2C and B2B. So as a matter of fact, you would find some uh, similar points. If you talk, for example, about um, product quality in B2C, uh, when we're selling products to the, to the end consumer, you know that if the product is good, it's all fine. But if the packaging is damaged, uh, let's say the, the label on a bottle of wine is a little bit skewed, then you can't sell it. It just doesn't work. And it would be the same on a B2B case. Uh, if, for example, the logo onto a product would be a little bit skewed, then you can't sell it as well. So the quality approach overall would be pretty much the same, be it B2B or b Obviously, uh, if you're dealing with direct consumer or, or businesses, the way you market your product, the way you handle the projects, a little bit different. I would say you may have a little bit more leeway on the consumer side, especially for, for marketing. Uh, you may try a lot of different things with a bit more rigid big corporates on a B2B side. It's more complicated. You would have to establish a very well-defined process, agendas going step by step, face by face, resetting everything. So putting the process and putting the rails basically so that the wagons can go smoothly again and again and again. So that's, I think, the, the, the major difference. And another question I have is, uh, I've almost never met a country manager or a business owner in Japan who does not have any challenges with recruitment. But, uh, <laughs> but in your <laughs> so I know you're more involved in tech now, but what do you see as some of the pitfalls of recruitment in tech in Japan? Well, um, the key resources to any business uh, really is, is people. So for tech and especially for international companies, you have is that you need to find obviously capable people. And there are a lot in Japan, even though uh, maybe in the software, more specifically software side, you may find less people than on the hardware side, for which Japan is still very strong. But the biggest issue is twofold. Uh, one is the language and uh, the ability to interact in English, let's say with uh, counterparts overseas be it in, uh, you know, for us in Singapore, uh, in Taiwan, etc. And the culture, having the proper fit is extremely important, extremely important. Uh, when uh, most of the companies coming up in tech, especially the startups, you would have a, a very new, different approach. So if you want to get people with experience, having spent, for example, um, pretty much all of their careers in big corporate, uh, when they're put into a startup environment and they need to do a lot of things um, for which they had a team doing, you know, uh, which was doing that for them, uh, they might be taken back. They might not be willing to do uh, well to broad this because they just don't know how to do it anymore. So finding the right balance is actually very complicated. Uh, convincing also some of these people to take the risk because you know you're a foreign company, so it's seen as far much more risky. And you're a startup, which is even riskier. So it's a big risk for, uh, let's say, a, a Japanese person mid-career to decide to go into such a company. Because if it fails, 
and it's always a possibility, it would be very hard for him to come back. So it's less true these days than it was uh, 10 years ago. Uh, it's changing, especially the younger generation is uh, far much more attracted to those kind of positions. But the total addressable market for English speaking professionals in Japan is roughly what, 2%? of the total population, the working population. And out of this, how many have the skill set and a good mindset? You're only looking at a, a few tens or hundreds of people max from which you can you can get the right person. So it's it's a challenge. It's a challenge. How and I've do, been working yes how, uh, how do I do that? <laughs> uh, no, I think this my my question is gonna be uh what are effective ways to present your company in terms of de risking the situation for them? Well, first of all, I think you have to be transparent. You, you have to speak the truth. Uh, so you have to present the situation, which is you, you can't hide the risk. And people would have to make the leap, kind of a leap of faith, understanding what are the risks involved. Because in case you lie about this, you know, then it will create trouble down the road. So one way to do, to do so, mitigation of the risk is obviously uh, on the operational side, on the strategic side. So in our interview process, we're having pretty much the founders involved uh, for the key positions. Uh, the founders of the company, we're having the CFO. Uh, so basically all the key decision makers are involved to introduce the mindset of the company, the culture, the strategy to make sure that everybody is aligned, that they understand very well where we're going, what it will take, what we're expecting from the person, what the person joining us can expect from us as well, so that it's totally transparent and for us the key factor is really culture really, really culture. if people don't understand what we are what we want to do and how we move there is no point in in them joining us so i had to to say no to quite a few people because of this so obviously it's it's a drag on, on scaling massively but we prefer to have the right people even if it takes a little bit more time uh, to do so it's so important so important awesome that was an awesome answer so there might be some corporates listening to this podcast thinking we want to enter the Japanese market and finding the right country manager is a big part of that. How to find the right or how to choose the right country manager? It's always a um, very difficult question. It depends on a lot of uh, factors, the business you are in, uh, the resources you have <laughs> also, because it's very different and the size of a business. As I said before, you don't want to have somebody who's uh, who spent 40 years in corporate, let's say, life to go and head up a startup. That's going to be very, very difficult. Factors of success are different. So you have to, to know that. I think culture is definitely key. And beyond this, the right manager would have some similar trait on uh, the ability to be a bridge between Japan and HQ or the other important countries or areas where the, the company is, uh, is doing business with. Because the, the culture, the business environment is so different from the HQ that you need to do, you need to educate HQ people as to what it means doing business in Japan. And that's as much as you need to educate, I mean, or, or train the team as to what it means to be, you know, whatever, whatever company, what's the culture, how to do things. So that's a major element. So aligning expectations uh, on both sides of you know, the, the scope is for me uh, one of the critical aspects. Handling uh, relationships, obviously, with the suppliers and the ability to go on the ground to ha well, basically uh, dirty your hands if need be, show up uh, is extremely important uh, in Japan. You don't want to be managing from a, a remote place, I think, in, in an ivory tower. Otherwise, you <laughs> you will lose a lot of understanding about what's happening. And one element is obviously Japanese Japanese language is complicated. It's difficult. So most of the expatriates coming over um, will struggle with that if they don't have a prior experience, if, it, if they haven't learned about it. So the ability to have people as your right hand, understanding that, helping you can definitely be of great help. Uh, so it all depends. But at the end of the day, uh, what I, I know is that some of the country managers I've known for big Japanese and big international corporates here, uh, when they go back home, basically a great deal of them go up to CEO uh, of their group. So coming to having a, a Japanese experience is definitely putting you on the right track 
let's say on the corporate later, if you're following this. If you're in a startup environment, as I said, a lot of different opportunities, a lot of companies looking at entering the market. So basically you may end up having, just like you, Tyson, way too many clients <laughs> to handle because basically everybody's interested and it's still a very huge market where lots of opportunities, but you have to be able to understand how to operate in Japan, how to operate with people from overseas uh, to find the right way. So the, the middle way, if I were to say so, uh, for me, is, uh, is the key of being successful here. That makes sense, though. If a person, let's say an expatriate, can succeed in Japan, well, let's say they'll have such a unique skill set where they could help the company in expansion into other countries because, let's say, entering Japan is, let's say, for an American company, let's say, probably harder for them to enter to Japan as opposed to Canada or maybe even <laughs> Europe as well. So just the level of complexity and... So that makes perfect sense. And I think one one silly advice to add is uh, if you do hire a country manager, uh, make sure that they're also not the country manager of multiple other companies. Sometimes I've heard cases where like they hired someone full time, but they're actually working full time for multiple companies as country manager. So mm -hmm. something you might have to do some due diligence. Sure. Uh, Obviously, in any case, I mean, a lot of um good resourceful people here it's also good to to bring people from overseas into the organization so that when they go back home they can also spread the gospel basically or spread the understanding about what it is to be and uh, they would have developed a very interesting skill set uh, in terms of quality in terms of product management in terms of into details for which this, this country is really really focused on and that's very helpful overall a lot of good things to learn about to bring back home uh, once you've done business in Japan. So that's why it's definitely putting people on, um, let's say, giving them a, a big visibility in the organization. And Japan is still a, a big market as well, third in the world. So please come, please try it out. Uh, it takes time, but uh, in the long run, uh, you'll be very, uh, very satisfied, I think, uh, with the choice you've made. Awesome. So. Yeah, as myself, mainly my experience in B2C, like I'm getting more interested in learning more about B2B from a, just a challenge point of view. And this has been uh, very useful for me and I'll probably listen to it again myself. But thanks so much for providing so much value. And I actually want to ask you as well, um, do you have any requests for the audience or like, uh, are you looking to hire any types of people? Uh, are you looking for any types of clients? Please tell us what you want. Sure. So as a board member also of the French Chamber of Commerce, I'm especially welcoming all the French speaking companies uh, looking to, to build a network. Uh, we can definitely help a lot of people and a lot of companies establishing their first steps in Japan and putting them on, on, on the right track. We're actually the largest uh, foreign chamber of commerce in Japan, uh, right before the, in terms of number of um, members, even before the US chamber. So quite proud about this knowing the relationship between the US and Japan. Second point is obviously for Unibees, uh, for SCS and Magotag as well, I'm currently recruiting a lot of people on sales, uh, marketing, pre-sales, technical, RMA processes, quality, so a lot of opportunities. Uh, you can apply on our websites, uh, you can contact me through LinkedIn, would be, uh, would be a right way. And uh, in case you need, you know, advice, some uh, pick somebody's brain, I can probably spare a bit of time to share information with you or introduce you to the right person. As a matter of, you know, it's a small community, business community here. It's always good to help each other. So always open to do so. Awesome. And we'll include those links that you mentioned in the show notes. Thanks, Tyson. Awesome. And thank you so much, Pascal. Thank you very much. Welcome to the end of the podcast. We appreciate you listening to the end of this Scaling Japan episode. And if you would like more great episodes on scaling your business in Japan, please check out www.scalingyourcompany.com forward slash podcasts.